Hey guys, it's a beautiful day here in upstate New York and it's a good reminder for me to get my butt outside. So I wanna make this a fairly short and sweet video. And I thought that we would go over some of the house plants that I'd like to see more in production. That means like more in commercial production. So more available to house plant enthusiasts. And part of the reason for that is we've done some really amazing tours just within the last few months. Uh, and we've gone to the Missouri Botanical Gardens, we've gone to some people's private collections, and you know, I'm, I'm sure we could all come up with a giant list of house plants that we wish were more available and also more affordable as well, because as you know, within the last two to three years, house plant prices have gone through the roof, partially because of supply demand, there's more people who love house plants and wanted to get into them, and there's more folks who wanted house plants that just weren't in production and are not in production, but in it, and that of course takes time. So on this channel, we have highlighted some of what it needs, what, what the industry basically needs and what it takes in order to get certain plants into production. And sometimes that is just years and years of research and development and then trying the plant into tissue culture and seeing if it would actually work in TC and if not, then actually, you know, doing uh, divisions, and of course that takes a longer time, or like leaf cuttings, all that type of stuff. So um, there's much to be said about that. So even though I say, hey, I'd would love to see these in production, I understand that there's a lot of limitations and a lot of bottlenecks with it. Now, it just so happens that the five plants that I'm going to showcase are ones that are aroid. So these are ones that are in that family of, you know, philodendron or monstera or raphidophora, those types of plants, which of course, a lot of folks are interested in. And part of the reason is because some of the field trips that we have been taking, namely to the Missouri Botanical Gardens, I'm thinking, is that we saw one of the largest aeroid collections that Emily took us through. And then we went with Tom Crowett and Emily and Monica, and they went and showed us some of their favorite aeroids from the, from the collections, which I think was really great because it, it gives us a deeper appreciation for certain species of plants that we might not know otherwise. So I am picking a lot from those tours. So if you've seen those tours, then you might actually uh, have a trip down memory lane for some of these plants. But without further ado, I'll go over the five plants that I would like to see in commercial production. So number one has a very cool name. It's called Gonadopus boivinii. Now, Gonadopus, I even mentioned in the video itself that it sounds like it's a mishmash of multiple different, like giraffe and hippopotamus, for instance, like multiple different animal names. But also the plant seems like a mishmash of different plants. So it seems like a little bit like a Zamiococcus zamiofolia. It seems a little bit like an amorphophallus. And it seems like, uh, what's the one with like a, uh, spines on? I can't think of the, the name off the top of my head. But it is like a mishmash of all those plants. So here's a little clip from the video so you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. That's a kind of cool name, Gonadopus. And um, I think I have some in the Climatron. But it's just kind of a fun plant because it has giraffe knees. That's what I call these on. I think you know, that's... I actually noticed that the ZZ plant has giraffe knees too. Sorry to go back to the ZZ, but strangely enough, I have to show you this story because I wonder if you ever experienced it with the ZZ, especially because all the plants are here. I noticed ZZs have these too. And I was walking and I snapped a branch and the next day later, the entire branch was over here, like away from the light and away from where it got yeah, snapped. It it uh, it helps. It's like the on the anthurium. Yeah. It helps it so that it kind of it's like an elbow. Yeah. It gives it the ability to, for the leaf to, to bend up and go easier than, than normal. Because some of these are pretty, um, you know. So it it can it can go towards the light. Yeah. And so. But these guys, what is interesting about these is it also does this, as you can see down here. Oh yeah. They'll they'll um, come up, and there's there's some over here, 
And these leaves will fall into other pots and actually take over the pot, like this one back here. The, uh, so the leaflet or the full leaf? Well, the le a leaflet, all a leaf, only a leaflet has to fall. Only the leaflet. Wow. Only a leaflet has to fall, yeah. and it will go down in the pot, and it'll just lay as litter in the pot. Yeah. And then the tubers themselves are white. They're beautiful, um, and they get rather big. And as you can see, they'll break open pots, too. Yeah. And um, this pot back here has its original plant in it, a Draconculus, but so which one is the original? The original is dormant. Oh, it's dormant. So the original is dormant, and, and it, uh, but uh, this is what has taken over most of the pot. So it, it does come up, and I need to repot it and take take it out. But I don't know; <laughs> it doesn't always work out that way. So I mean, these are just kind of fun, and you yeah. don't see these a lot, and it's got kind of a fun name. It, it's got a really, it seems like a Dr. Seuss, like an octopus with something like a <laughs> giraffe, like. Right. But, so, but I, I do wonder about these little knobby knees, because I'm, the thing that was striking to me about the ZZ, and I'm sure it probably happens with this one, is that it sensed danger. It was, it's not like it moved towards the light. It sensed danger oh, because okay. it got cut and it literally moved to the opposite end of where it got hit, hit and broken. Okay, so I have I to notice like, that. Wow, that is just like so neat. So if you ever accidentally break one, I'd be curious as I to might which... even do it on purpose oh, just no, to see. Don't say, that. <laughs> don't say that. So you'll have noticed that the other cool aspect about the plant is that it has this holvenus right on the petiole and I think that gives it the ability for the plant to actually move and one of the things that I had mentioned there is that my Zamiel Kulka Zamiofolia, one day I walked by it, there was a stem that was sticking out like this, and I accidentally clipped the tip of it. So it got completely cut off at the top. And where that little swollen um, nub was, it actually moved the plant away from the light and away from danger all the way to the other side. I couldn't believe it. it happened within 24 hours, probably less than that because it happened during the day and by the morning I woke up, it was already moved to the other side. So, you know, that's, there's a lot to be said. So even though we think plants are rooted in the ground, it's, it's very cool to be able to see plants move um, in many different ways and that's a great example. And I'm sure, even though I'm not familiar with the Gonadopus, that there's uh, probably other, um, uh, ways that that actually moves within the environment. And I should say that that plant is actually native to Africa. So where you actually find Zamiococcus zamiofolia, you'll probably find Gonadopus. I think it's more in sandy deciduous tree areas. I'm not sure of the conservation status of that plant. And it's not the only species within the genus. So there's, uh, I think about a half dozen different species within the Gonadopus genus. And I don't know much more about them, but I, I guess Gonadopus uh, boivani is, has been found in some people's collections. And I know it wouldn't be necessarily uh, a plant that would be typically introduced in the commercial production only because it's a plant that has a caustic latex. So like a euphorbia, but we find lots of euphorbia and they have caustic latex in the commercial production. So I think that you could probably get away with that. The other thing that Emily mentioned that was really interesting with Gonadopus boivani is that it just is so easy to reproduce. So it has those tubers, you could cut off a leaf and it will fall off and it would start to propagate. So those are things that I think are you know really useful for a plant. It's one thing that if you are in an area and it's not native to that area and you have the right kinds of climate conditions, it could really spread and it could probably be an invader because it's able to propagate so much. But um, for a house plant, you wouldn't have to worry about that. Okay, so for the second one, I'm gonna say anything nephthitis. Nephthitis is such a cool genus. And I wanted to bring this out there because I had gotten a, neph a nephthitis swanii back, oh, it was probably like back three or four Aroid shows ago, um, the International Aroid Society show. And I got one and it just makes this such this darling little, uh, you know, shape. It's, it's very small. It has a spade shaped or arrow shaped head. It gets these cute little tiny flowers on it, 
with the spadix and spathe, and it gets these nice bright orange berries. And I'm gonna put it out there into the world because my Nephtitis swainii, uh, swainii, I think I might have accidentally killed it. <laughs> I, I don't know, the, 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 the rhizomatous part of it is actually still green, so I'm gonna try to resuscitate it and give it some life back. I'm actually, that's probably one of the plants I'm going to be quickly bringing up from Brooklyn and bring it here, and I wish I actually uh, brought it up like two months ago when it still had leaves on it. But um, it just decided, it was just like one of those plants that I could keep in the corner and kind of forget about for a long time. Um, it just kept chugging along and getting bigger and bigger and flowering. And shortly after flowering, I noticed it just started to kind of like go downhill. And with my trips kind of back and forth to Brooklyn and upstate New York and doing a lot of renovations and landscaping here, it's just been getting to be a little bit too much. So I've kind of decided, okay, I'm gonna cut back my plants, I'm gonna take little cuttings, um, and I'm gonna take like little rhizomes, and I'm just gonna repropagate plants again so that it's easier for me to actually transport plants back and forth. Um, that one has been on my list to, of things to take, but um, over the last number of weeks, I've been taking care of a, a chicken that had cancer, and I've been shuttling her back and forth on the bus, so bringing plants on the bus just would have been a little bit more of a challenge for me. So that's a little aside. I don't think you need to know all that. But Nephthitis is such a cool genus. It's one of the uh, genera that we had seen at the Missouri Botanical Gardens again. And some of them are super cool looking. Like they remind me of like the shapes of some certain African masks. It's also another African aroid. So again, there's something kind of very exotic and neat about that plant, given that it's grown up on another continent, um, atypical to uh, a lot of aroids, which you'd find throughout Central and South America, for instance. I mean, of course we have aroids here growing in the Northeast as well, which is something that I'll probably go over on the, our sister channel at Flock Finger Lakes eventually, but um, you know, and you could find aroids on, on all different continents, but for whatever reason, the ones on the African continent just have this kind of certain je ne sais quoi about them that make them very unique. And so I'll show you a little clip of that so you get a sense of nephthitis and why I think it should be something that would be great for commercial production. And also, despite the fact that I had a little snafu recently with my nephthitis, it's been a very uncomplaining, very easy to care for plant in general for a very long period of time. So we start from here mm -hmm. and we see like all the variation until we get up to this tiny little yes. guy, right? Which I love that one. Uh -huh. Yeah. So this is the genus. So to me, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to pick one species. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes I just pick, okay, I love this genus. Yes. Right? I, so, I'm the same way with Peperomia. I'm like, I love yeah. Peperomia. Oh, so, are so yeah. cute. Yes. Yeah. Like, oh, they're so cute. <laughs> so this genus is Nephthitis. Yes. And it's originally endemic to, uh, to Africa, right? So there are very few aeroids in Africa, mm. but the ones that are there are very unique. They are very weird, right? Uh, we don't know, like historically, like among millions of years, what happened to the aeroids in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's too dry for them to thrive, or maybe they were there, and um, when it started to dry out, they started to go extinct, mm -hmm. right? But there are very few, but they are very, very unique. Mm -hmm. So we were looking um, in the Climatron at Anturions that kind of like look like that, yeah. like that shape. Yeah, we did see some. Uh -huh. is oh. this a, what is this? Anturion berrosavaliensis from Mexico. Uh -huh. So the Mexican group is the weird. It's one of the weirdest groups of Anturions. This looks like almost like a nephthitis. Yes, yeah. yes, it does. And actually, it's super funny that you say it because the fruits yeah. are orange. Oh, they're orange Just too. like oh, nephthitis would be. Oh my gosh. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So it's like very nice, very nice eye. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, but it's definitely Anturium flower, right? Yeah. The flowers yeah, are flower exactly so, the same. Yeah. yeah. So they're from Mexico. I love and, that shape though, that, sh that And one thing that we learned actually from crossing Anturios mm -hmm. is that the Mexican group kind of like cross with each other really well, but it doesn't cross with anything else in South America or any, anywhere else. So they are their own little entity. Yeah. And when we started doing the DNA analysis, mm -hmm. they definitely come out as a very distinct separate group. And they, they also have the uh, orange, mm -hmm. inflores the orange fruits, right? So we're like, okay, is that the same thing or is it not the same thing? Right. Well, the clue is, and I actually found, there we go. Oh, 
in the flowers. Okay. So we were talking about aeroids, mm -hmm. and there are basically two groups of aeroids. Mm -hmm. The ones that have the female, f the, the female flowers at the bottom, like this, yep. and the male flowers at the top. So right. you can see two different regions of flowers. Mm -hmm. So you're only going to find pollen on the top, and this one is actually dropping some pollen in yeah. there, right? And you can have, find the fruits and the, and the female, female flowers yeah. at the bottom. So that is nephthytes. When we look at anthurium, all the flowers from the bottom to the top look the same mm -hmm. because they have both male and female parts together. Right. Right. Now, is this one, would mm -hmm. this be cell fertile or is this trying to, probably being fertile at one point and then the female is fertile at another point? Yes. Yeah, so okay. usually to avoid uh, crossing yourself mm -hmm. because that tends to lead to another, a lot of genetic diseases, right? right? They shed the pollen at a different time than the bottom uh, is parts, the female parts mm -hmm. are resected, mm -hmm. right? So they can even be within the same day, mm -hmm. morning and afternoon, or within different days, like even within a week of separation. Mm -hmm. So most of the plants tend to be, um, tend to avoid that crossing, in, it's herself, crossing themselves yeah. by separating the sexes, right? Yeah. Separating them in the space and separating them in time as well. So what species do we have here? And do, uh -huh. they, do they span across a specific country or countries within Africa? Or uh, do we I, see this across the continent? I think most continent? of the ones that we have in here are from Gabon. Okay. Because... They have a nice rainforest there. They have yeah. a nice rainforest. Yeah. And we at the garden had a really nice program in the early 90s in yeah. Gabon. Okay. So we had a lot of people collecting a species in the area. So which one do we have in there? Okay, Poisoni. so the Poisoni. Yeah. yeah. So this one is the same. So this one seems to be different. Af Afzelia. Afzelia. Uh -huh, Afzelia. Yeah. And then over here we have the same point sunny, but on the other side. That's the, the little the splice, little bitty like one. Eye, right? Yeah, or the little bitty one. Yes. So this one is from Ghana. So mm -hmm. this one we actually have the the place where we collected it. And I find these to be pretty tough plants, actually. Yes. There's times where I forget to even water mine, mm -hmm. and it just kind of sits exactly. there in the back and puts well, out new leaves and puts out these little tiny flowers. Well, like if you think about like Africa, Africa yeah. is a pretty tough continent in yeah, terms absolutely. of climate, right? Yeah. So if you are not tough enough to make it in Africa, mm -hmm. you will not make it in a house, right. right? Right. So yeah, like African plants do very well in when we forget about them yeah. in the house. Yes. Exactly. I just think they they look like masks, which are are yes. pretty. Cool. Oh, like, really neat. Yeah. This one is also F. Zellii. The shapes of them are just so, so cool. Almost like a superhero mask. <laughs> yeah, I love those. I'm sorry. So yeah, so we have a smaller collection of African things, mm -hmm. but they're, they're so unique. Like I just, I just love seeing these things. And especially because I've never been to Africa, so I would love to oh, see those fantastic. things in a while. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so for number three, I'm going to choose Apple Ballas Acumenatissima. I think I said that right. So Apoballus is a new genus to me, and I didn't actually see that at Missouri Botanical Gardens. I'm not sure if they have the Apoballus. They might. But I saw that at Ill Exotics in Philadelphia. So that was with our recent tour. And there were a lot of cool things that they had there, but Apoballus really stuck out to me. And I think um, they said it was sim something similar to uh, you know, Franco had said that it's something similar to uh, like a schismatoglossus, uh, but together with an aglionema. And I think that's probably a really fair description of it, though I haven't actually grown it myself, but it has that schismatoglossus uh, look to it, but it also is easy like an aglionema to grow. And the leaves are just absolutely gorgeous. It has everything that people like look for in leaves. So it has this kind of glossy verdigious hue but it has this modeling on the top so dark greens with like this kind of blue green and then a very beautiful purplish eggplant hue an aubergine hue if you will down below and it just has a nice spread to it and it probably doesn't get leggy like you would see in typical aglionemas or diefenbachia so if you grow aglionemas and diefenbachias for a long period of time, oftentimes they'll start to get caney or leggy, so they just get kind of like long stems down below, and it could look a little odd. You could always chop those off and reroot them and all that kind of stuff to make it look like cute and squat again. 
But that one really stuck out to me. I don't know much else about it. I mean, that would be something that I'd have to go and research. And I can't say much because I didn't walk away with that from Ill Exotics. I haven't been really buying too many plants. I bu bought some, but I haven't been buying too many plants just because um, of the back and forth. And I, I, you know, I'm bringing more of my plants here and less and less so in, in Brooklyn and cutting back a lot within Brooklyn. So just to make things a little easier, but that would definitely be one on my list. And of course, you know, Franco at Ill Exotics has those plants. He had like, you know, maybe a dozen of those plants available, tiny ones, you know, like in a three and a half inch pot or so. Um, but I haven't seen that in, on a wider level. You know, when I start seeing things in supermarkets, that's when I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's hit the prime time. Or if you start seeing it at your like Home Depot or your Lowe's or something along those lines, that's when you know that the plant has hit prime time. I mean, if you remember, if you recall, these ZZ Ravens were so hard to come by and then all of a sudden you saw them at your supermarkets for $15 or for like $14.99 or something along those lines. Um, so that's when you know like the plant has actually made it and you don't have to be spending like $150 on a small little plant or a little a, a little unrooted cutting, if you will. It's really gotten that ridiculous in some cases with some of the plants. So anyway, so that's one that I would definitely recommend and that I'd like to see go into commercial production because I think people would really enjoy that. Okay, so number four, number four. I am going to pick one that I hadn't really discussed or talked about, I actually don't even know if it made it into the whole, the whole Aroid tour that we did at Missouri Botanical Gardens, but that's where I was introduced to it. In fact, I think I had seen it once before in the tour, hold on, let me think, the Amazon Spheres tour. That's like vintage, that's old school style now. Um, but that was a really cool tour. And they had there at the Amazon tour, they had three pink plants or plants with pink edging, if I remember correctly. And they had a begonia, uh, which was very cool, but I don't think that would go into commercial production because it's a little bit too finicky to take care of. And they had an amorphophallus, and I believe this was the same amorphophallus that I saw at the Missouri Botanical Gardens, if my memory um, serves me correctly. And it's amorphophallus henrii. So that one has this very nice velvety dark green, approaching green black leaf with the faintest beautiful coral pink edging along the leaves. And it's actually a shorter amorphophallus. Wow, that one's just so cool. I think anything with pink edging, obviously like people pay attention to it. I mean, it's pretty neat. You, you often you know, see pink on flowers and things along those lines. You see pinks on bracts, but pink around the edging of a leaf. And actually that was one of the things, if you recall, that I had asked Tom Crowett about. What does it mean when you have this kind of pink or red, ed red edging that you often see on aroids? So if you wanna go back to that episode, I'll link to it here and you'll be able to hear what he had to say about that. But um, Amorphophallus henrii, I think that is a very cool one. Um, I've never grown it before. Uh, you don't often see Amorphophallus in the trade. I did recently get an Amorphophallus cognac that I'm growing outside here and it's in zone five and I'm gonna mulch it pretty heavy, but that supposedly is a plant that could actually handle zone five, zone six. I'm kind of on the borderline of zone five, zone six, and I have it in a protected area. So I'm gonna see if it actually emerges. Um, I know a number of people actually grow it around here because it's one of the, the amorphophallus that can handle a bit colder temperatures. It's more cold hardy. So that's one for number four that I'd like to see. I don't think this, the one that I'm mentioning is cold hardy, so it'd have to be a house plant. Okay, number five, which is probably my number one really, because this one I went gaga for. It was so damn beautiful. In fact, I may have actually withheld this one on Monica's selections in her 10 Aroid selections. So if you saw that one, it actually should have went into that episode, but I loved this one so much. 
And actually, Franco from Il Exotics had one growing, but I didn't actually recognize it because I think in the conditions that it was growing in, it just didn't develop the conditions that um, make this plant so gorgeous. I'm not saying that Franco's was not gorgeous. It was just like, I think you need to grow it in a little bit more shady conditions for it to actually develop the leaf color and texture that it, it's known for. But drum roll. <laughs> Anthurium Carla Blackii. Oh my gosh, this plant is so beautiful. And I know some people have it in their collection, I get it. But this is one that I think would be such a no brainer for uh, commercial production because it's very similar to, it's in that same grouping as like Clarinerviums and Magnificums, that kind of stuff. So it has this really beautiful velvety leaf, but it's like black velvet like black green velvet. And when you're growing it more in the shade, it seems to be blacker and blacker, has really defined veins. And when you turn it over, it's like white. Another one of my newest favorite plants is this guy over here. Well, I'm not gonna be able to get you out because it's starting in this Oh, it's starting <laughs> but in that it's one. this okay. guy. Okay. okay. So Anthurium Carla Blackiae. This one I saw yesterday and I was like, this is the most beautiful anthurium I've it ever is. seen. It is, it's <laughs> totally. Okay, so this guy has been in our collection probably since the 90s. Yeah. We had no idea what it was. Yeah. We tried to compare it to other things. We tried to find it in the wild mm -hmm. and finally people in Panama found it again in mm -hmm. the wild because we saw it was cultivated. Mm -hmm. It's just so pretty. It's so pretty. Exactly. It's like yeah. it has to be cultivated. Yeah. So people found it again in the wild in Panama and we were finally able to publish it. 2020. Yeah. Brand new species. Yeah. But we, we knew about it. We call it Carla Blackia for the longest time. Yeah. And I love two things about this guy. So of course the leaves, yeah. like those velvety leaves that everybody loves when they're talking about anthurium. The back of the leaf is also pretty cool. Like, Look how white, it's uh -huh. like greenish white, it's like contrasty. Exactly, yeah, yeah like yeah. super dark yeah. and super light. Yeah. And of course this tiny little inflorescence that is, is green right now, but when it's mature, it's bright yellow. Mm. And it's just like the most beautiful, tiny little thing ever. And the spathe is lovely too. It's got white with a little pink edge. With edging. a little pink yeah. edges. It's yeah, beautiful. It's, yeah, it's like, it looks like, oh my God. I saw this yesterday and I was like, this has probably got to be like one of my favorites out of all. Mm -hmm. I, and I also just saw an amorphophallus over there that has like the black leaves with pink edging and a really oh, beautiful. Yes. Yes. That one's gorgeous yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. I'm attracted to that kind of blackish, yeah. like dark color. But um, yeah. one thing that a lot of people don't know about this velvet leaf, mm -hmm. of course, because they have never paid attention to that mm -hmm. in like super, super detail, is that the velvety comes from little lenses mm -hmm. that are on top of each one of the cells mm -hmm. of the leaf. So remember when you were a kid, hopefully you didn't do it, but you might know about it that you use a, a magnifying glass to kind of concentrate the light like, into yeah. ants yeah. and try to kill the ants. <laughs> yeah. Okay, hopefully you didn't try that at home, but if you did, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So the same concept of mm -hmm. concentrating light into an area is what's happening in this leaf. Mm -hmm. Each one of the cells has a little magnifying glass on top that is actually like this shape, mm -hmm. like a little bubble mm -hmm. on top. It concentrates all the sun and makes it right into the cell where the photosynthesis is happening. So all these species tend to grow super well in cloudy forests, in the bottom uh, layer of the floor of the forest floor, uh, because they can capture all the light yeah. with this like strategy. I always think of like the, on a cellular level, like mm -hmm. the, it's, it's optics at the yes, end of the day. The, cell, the cells are like little eyes yeah. and mm -hmm. the way that they're shaped, if they're convex mm -hmm. or, you know, as you're saying, concave or mm -hmm. whatever it might be, you get a sense of like what, what is making that sheen or that shape or that exactly. color. Yeah. yeah. So for us, it just looks like, oh, velvet mm -hmm. pretty mm -hmm. for the plant. It's actually functioning for something. Like exactly. there is a reason why they're like that, not right. just because we like it <laughs> to be like that. So this plant is just like amazing specimen of the general group yeah. that has the velvet leaf. Yeah. I believe it's not in cultivation yet, but it definitely should be. It should be, it absolutely should be. Should be. Just yeah. beautiful. It's just so gorgeous. I mean, you just want to pet it. Um, I'd probably try to keep it up high away from my, my uh, you know, 
five and a half, six foot wingspan. So, cause I would probably want to just touch it all the time. I mean, it just looks so inviting. And again, it's in that genre of anthuriums that like people really enjoy at this moment. And maybe they will always enjoy those anthuriums. Maybe they will never go out of style. But that one is one that I saw in the Missouri Botanical Gardens collection. And again, I actually asked this of, of Tom in one of our kind of tours with him. And I was like, how come Missouri Botanical Garden doesn't work with like a commercial grower and actually, you know, grow some of these out or even some of their hybrids, which they don't really care much about. They're really more focused on the research of the species of aroids. But, you know, those types of things I think would be really great. And there could be a real focus on, and emphasis on conservation collections. And a lot of, uh, I think a lot of growers, maybe not every grower, but like a good portion of growers actually do and, and houseplant enthusiasts actually do care about that kind of stuff. Um, and they're interested in that kind of stuff. I said, more often than not, people just want nice house plants and they want to make their house look nice. You know, I, I get that. But there are, is probably a little subset of folks, including myself, that would be really interested in growing some plants for conservation. And actually, that's some of the stuff that I'm interested here at Flock and growing outdoors, you know, for the things that actually, you know, grow in my climate. You know, I obviously can't grow like tropical plants in my climate unless I actually take them in and then, uh, you know, house them in a greenhouse or in, in the house and then take them out um, during the summer months. But all right, guys, so that was my five house plants. Well, they're kind of like tropical plants, not yet house plants. One of them is. But those are my five plants that I would love to see in commercial production. Now, I'm sure I could come up with a much larger list and maybe in a future episode I will. But if you have some plants that you would like to see into pr in production, why don't you list them in the, in the comments below? Because I'm sure readers would like to learn from all of you as well and to see what other plants that you'd like to actually see in production. And again, these are plants that some people out there may actually already have in their collection and they're growing it. But I would like to actually see these grow um, more mainstream, go more mainstream and actually go into like tissue culture or um, uh, just general production so that we could see it in our supermarkets, in our Home Depots, in our plant shops, in our Lowe's, things like that. Because I think that once plants make it to the, that um, situation, they've kind of quote unquote, like made it, made it into our hearts and made it into our homes. So thank you guys. Thanks guys for always tuning in here to Plant One On Me. Um, Take a moment, subscribe, hit the notifications if you haven't already. It really helps the channel grow. And a portion of our, actually 1% of our Google AdSense proceeds actually go back to plant conservation. So last year was the first year that we were able to do that. And that's awesome. We actually did it through the Cactus and Succulent group through the Desert Garden um, Society. And that was really cool because that goes directly towards plant conservation of cacti and succulents. And I want to um, thank uh, all the folks out there who are focused on plant conservation. And if you have good plant conservation organizations that you know or that you work with, I'm actually looking at a, a number of ones that are here locally to New York. Um, let me know also in the comments below. I'm very interested in that because there's just not a lot of funds that go towards plant conservation, but I think all of you know how important plants are to not only our lives, but also the greater world and all of the ecosystems that are out there because it is literally the, the base of the habitat that we all live on. So anyway, thank you guys, lots of love, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye. <laughs> the doors are closing.